You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andy Tanner. This is where we do our very best to make investing simple. Uh, as always, very exciting show, uh, exciting episode I have for our guest, uh, John Cochran. We're going to be speaking about uh, his book, The Fiscal Theory of the Price Level. Tremendous experience in monetary policy. You know, I'm going to let him introduce himself uh, a little bit. But uh, first of all, a huge welcome and a big thank you, uh, John, for being on our program today. Thanks. Pleasure to be with you. This will be a lot of fun. Um, we'll be speaking about, uh, about your book primarily, but we're going to dive into a, a lot of monetary policy, I would imagine. But uh, give it a little bit of your background and how, how did you come to decide to write this book and why an interest in, uh, in price level? All right. Well, I'm a, uh, let's see, I'm an economist <laughs> and I spent uh, 30 years at the University of Chicago, first the economics department business school. Now I'm a senior fellow here at uh, the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And uh, I've been thinking about um, <clears throat> inflation and money and that stuff my whole professional life. Uh, in part, just it's a uh, great puzzle. Where does inflation come from anyway? And you start to look at the theories we got and they don't really make sense. So that's, you know, what we do in life is, is try to find a better one that uh, makes more sense. So uh, we've been at it ever since. And that's uh, what the fiscal theory of the price level is kind of a compendium of everything I've learned about that for the last, uh, gosh, gosh, how many years? Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I got tremendously lucky in that uh, I submitted the draft of this book uh, um, in March, 2021, when there was no inflation. And um, fortunately the government did just what I said not to do. Uh, shovel a trillion, couple trillion bucks yep. of money out the window and gave inflation. So that at least will help my book sales, I hope. You know, we have had, uh, we have, this is a very common topic on our podcast. It's, it's very important. And I, I don't mind um, so many pers perspectives because I think the more perspectives people hear, the better, and they can, you know, become more educated. I, I get a little nervous whenever I speak to, to people uh, who have achieved great things in academia. This is the closest I'll ever get to going to Stanford. Let's just say that for sure. <laughs> but uh, what an important time uh, in our life uh, for sure. Let, let's first of all talk about... Uh, Let's talk about the Fed's uh, conundrum. At least, maybe it, maybe it's not. I think it's quite a conundrum, in that uh, you know, finally they they you know they were missing their two percent target for so long, which tells me there was extreme deflationary forces at bay. Whether that be technology, whether that be globalization, you know, whatever those forces are, they're the very significant deflationary force because they were in an in an inflationary policy uh, largely and then covid hits and this unspeakable amount of money i mean just incredible uh unspeakable amount of money is borrowed and, and infused and they say well this is transitory and it turns out it's not so uh, i kind of have my eye on two things you tell me if i'm wrong on the one side i'm looking at inflation which uh, seems to be very 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 much not transitory very real and now my other eyes on the labor market, because as their policy tightens, uh, I think that, you know, we've seen a few layoffs. Don't they kind of have, an, uh, in this case, this dual mandate of price stability and, and full employment with the same very blunt instrument now of, of, rates, uh, of, of rate as their tool? Is it kind of hard to fine tune this now with these two major, we have major inflationary forces and major deflationary forces. How are they going to balance this out? Well, you got about uh, three questions in there. So <laughs> that's uh, my habit. Me, I'll practice. give you three answers. Okay. <laughs> I'll start with the, 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 your premise um, that the last, uh, that the pre COVID years were extreme deflationary forces. Uh, I, I'll disagree with that. You know, they were missing their inflation targets by, uh, by tiny amounts. Uh, if I'm a central banker and my target's 2%, it comes in at 1.7. I hang up a mission accomplished sign and say, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. We don't really measure inflation that well anyway. Inflation was low 
uh, steady. Any little blips came and went very quickly. It was just a, a lovely period for monetary policy. Now, the Fed seemed to need to think that they, they uh, need to be out in front of every parade. Uh, and so they made a lot of noise about stuff. But it was just a very, it was a quiet period. I do think, you know, the Fed got itself into a psychology that says exactly what you think, that, that we have to be, um, and, and, and they kind of went back to the strategies of the 1970s um, in many ways, saying we really have to fight deflation, fight deflation, fight deflation, which then when the battle turned the other way, they were a little caught flat-footed. Uh, you've got a second question you asked, is you got it exactly right. In my view, where did this inflation come from and why did the Fed miss it so enormously, which is a, a really big question. I mean, why were they caught so flat-footed? They did not see inflation coming. They sort of said it would go away for a whole year. It completely missed the boat. Uh, and I think that the answer is, is uh, fiscal theory of the price level. Remember, I'm here to plug a book, right? Sure, yeah. Uh, it came exactly, as you said, from um, uh, the government handed out trillions of dollars worth of money, which the Fed printed up $3 trillion of that money and, and gave it to people. Uh, some of that was necessary. It was not, you know, it shouldn't have done nothing in the pandemic, but it was vastly overdone. Yeah. And, and, you know, as even Milton Friedman said, you throw trillions of dollars of money from helicopters, you get inflation. Now, it's interesting, you know, even now, I, I just saw uh, Powell's latest speech, is not really willing to talk about fiscal policy. <laughs> uh, you right. know, where did this inflation come from? Yada, yada, the dog ate my homework, but let's not talk <laughs> about the elephant in the room. Right. Which I think is a little bit uh, political reasons. But that, you know, one of the, how did the Fed miss this in inflation? How did they not see it coming? There ought to be a big inquest now. I mean, you know, we're looking at why do trains derail? Why can't we look at why does... Uh, why does the Fed miss inflation? Right. Uh, and part of it is just uh, blinders on this question that, that fiscal largesse uh, really pushes inflation. And then you asked about going forward. Indeed, raising interest rates is a blunt uh, tool. And the situation, fiscal policy is still on steroids. We've got trillion-dollar deficits even though the economy is completely recovered. So the poor Fed is, is you know, you're like in a car and it's, it's rolling down the road and, and the driver's got the uh, gas, uh, you know, foot down the gas all the way to the floor. And you, you can pull on the parking brake a little bit, uh, but that is, as you said, a blunt instrument. Yeah, tr they get at best sort of lower interest sensitive spending while all the other spending is going on uh, like nuts. And uh, I think we're going to find uh, that it is a, a blunt and not, not, an instrument not as powerful as everybody thinks, in part because monetary and fiscal policy go together. If the Fed raises interest rates, that raises interest costs on the debt, that raises the deficit. So you've kind of poured some more fire uh, on, yeah. on uh, yep. gas on the fire that's that's causing it in in the, in, in any way. So uh, absolutely, um, it, it, you said it's hard to uh, I think hard to foresee, which is yes, it is. Uh, and it's uh, the Fed does not have anywhere near as much control as they would like everyone to believe. Now, I I love the title of your book, The Fiscal Theory of Price Level. We're going to speak a little bit about fiscal policy because uh, certainly the 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 Fed and also Congress. Well, I say the Treasury rather in in uh, selling bonds. Uh, those those bonds are the main instrument. Certainly, there's mortgage backed securities and. They've expanded uh, what they did since since 08. Before we hop into that, I want to circle back because whenever I can find someone to disagree with me, I rejoice because it means I'm about to learn something. You know, <laughs> me too. You know, when I say because uh, I want to make I want to learn a lot here. When I say that I felt there was tremendous deflationary force, I in my mind I picture an arm wrestle with two huge arm wrestlers, big biceps going at it. And while the, the, the match might not move, they might just sit there dead center, kind of shaking a little bit, you know, like you say, 1.7% one way or the other way, even if they overshot by 1.7%, maybe no one panics. But to me, I looked at the, the fiscal or the monetary policy, even before we hit COVID in, in, uh, in around September of 2019, uh, there was an interesting period where, before that, where the Fed was trying to reload their gun, it looked like. They were trying to raise rates, and the, the stock market didn't like that. Even before COVID, though, they, they changed their mind, and they started uh, to raise rates. So when I say tremendous deflationary force, I wouldn't interpret that as deflationary movement. I would, infl you know, like a, a force to me 
the, you know, the reason I don't fall through my chairs, there's a force holding me up. And let me tell you, there's a tremendous gravitational force uh, based on the Ben and Jerry's that I eat. So even though I'm not moving, I'm pushing back on that earth, you know, with, uh, well, we're not going to say how many pounds. <laughs> so, so you didn't think, so, so how do we have, uh, how did they achieve that stability without such accommodative policy if there wasn't massive deflationary force with such inflationary uh, policy? Uh, this is a great uh, question. And um, it, you actually asked a very sophisticated question. And it's one that uh, that, that episode I actually regard as, as, as very important experiment for the fiscal theory of the price level versus other theories and, and it comes out ahead. How do we interpret this long period of the 2010s with interest rates stuck at zero, yeah. lots of QE, yeah. and inflation just goes nowhere? Yeah. And there's two views of this. One view says there is a, you're a captain of a ship and it's all quiet. It's 1.72%. So on one view that the ship is steering the precise course between a a whirlpool of deflation on one side and and a hurricane of hyperinflation on the other side. And the the clever captain is just offsetting those big deflationary forces with the hyperinflation of, of QE. Maybe. The other theory is maybe it was really quiet last night. <laughs> okay. And, and in, in the fiscal theory, in the, in the way I look at it, if the Fed just sets an interest rate and leaves it alone, inflation won't spiral up or downwards. Mm. And quantitative easing is like making change. I'll take your 20s and give you two fives and a 10. Because mm-hmm. that's what they do. They buy government bonds and yep. they give you interest-bearing reserves instead. It's, an op- yep. it's a change operation. And, you know, the first order taking your twenties and giving you two fives and a 10 isn't making you going to make you go out and spend and do anything crazy anywhere. So uh, uh, the fiscal theory says in a time when of quiet, there's no big fiscal policy isn't doing great, but there's no big news about things one way or the other. And the fed is setting interest rates at wherever it's setting interest rates and QE doesn't really matter. It's just a, it's a marketing game, not really an economic game Mm -hmm. that the economy is quiet. It was quiet last night. And the view you put out is a very common view. No, there's this huge vortex of a deflationary spiral threatening every minute. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, the the Fed put in like Zimbabwe-like monetary growth (laughs) and just offset it. Well, I I cite you Occam's razor, which is the simpler uh, solution to those things. So it is a a very telling episode, but I think it really Mm -hmm. tells us that if the Fed just leaves interest rates alone, uh, inflation, and if fiscal policy doesn't come at us with trillions of dollars of unexpected uh, deficits, uh, inflation is going to be pretty stable and doesn't really matter what they do. It, fascinating stuff. Now let's move to fiscal policy a little bit because they do uh, go hand in hand. I probably spend more time looking at the, the Fed balance sheet than, uh, than the Congress. Uh, the, you know, We have the, con- the Congressional Budget Office does a report the Government Accountability Office, where the Comptroller of the United States does a report. In all the reports I've ever read on, I read them every year on the fiscal side, the, the word that I think I've seen used uh, that, that pokes out at me is unsustainable. They, they use that word uh, over and over and over again. When I think of their liability side, I think of two kinds of liabilities. The first, I try to make this simple for people and correct me if I'm wrong on this. The first I says, look, there's money you can borrow and that's bonds. That's funded liability. I, I make a promise to you, but you give me cash for that promise. But then we have, so that's borrowed money. Then you have promised money, which is, you know, entitlement programs. And certainly during COVID, it was unbelievable. The amount of money that was just you know, written, and I'm I'm not going to be political on whether this was needed or not needed. Certainly, healthcare is a big part of that. Uh, you know, income stability was a new word I had you know had not been that familiar with, and so we have money that we promised people. So if we look at the money that we borrowed, uh, that's you know, well, we'll call it thirty tr- thirty two trillion. Is that fair? Somewhere in that neighborhood, yep. you know, low thirties. A little bit more debate on the amount of money that's promised because you have to ch- choose a time frame, right? I mean, policy and demographics here might give us a future, and we don't know what healthcare costs will be. So I've heard everywhere, you know, between one hundred trillion to two hundred trillion in a GDP that's you know mid twenties maybe. 
is the fiscal path, you know, I, I, we, we, we have to print this money to buy these bonds. We have to have demand for bonds. I think the fiscal policy might be as equally fascinating because a, not everyone in the world, uh, wants, uh, the U S is the world's reserve currency. I don't know. I think it'd be hard to unwind that, but I think there's people that like to, I think you have electronic money or crypto type of, of instruments. China is certainly interested in that. So tell me a little bit about is the fiscal side unsustainable from a, the, the off balance sheet, or what, what we might call the promised money, the unfunded liability side, that hundred trillion plus, what, what is that? Or is it also unsustainable because money's going to change and a, and a U.S. Treasury might not be that risk-free instrument that the world runs on? So kind of a two-part question. Unsustainability in terms of promised money and does the change in, in how money or currency you know, seems to be under, undergoing is, is it sustainable to stay on our current fiscal trajectory? Well, no, no is the short answer. <laughs> now I'll give you the long answer. Yeah, uh, give me I, the, I like exactly the long right. answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right to separate two issues. One issue is our current debt, which is about 100% of GDP, about five years of federal revenues. And then there's the future spending uh, promises. And, and we focus a lot on the debt. But actually, you know, 100% of GDP debt is, is not something, that's something our country can pay off. And if you just return to steady surpluses, small surpluses in good times and let the economy grow, uh, that debt can be paid off. Uh, the real problem is where we've, we've made all these promises of future spending. Yeah. And in fact, even if we defaulted on the debt or inflated away the debt today, that doesn't solve the fiscal problem. The fiscal problem is an enormous amount of promises for Social Security and health care primarily yep. uh, that uh, don't correspond to the taxes to pay for them. And that problem... E- you know, get rid of all the debt today. That's you. In fact, that makes it worse because now you lose your capacity. Can we just? Couldn't we just tax the rich uh, so, and fix that? Nope. <laughs> uh, and here, I, I don't. You don't need to be right wing about this at all. Just read the Congressional Budget Office uh, long term right. uh, budget forecasts, which are excellent, uh, and they'll just uh, go through. There's just not enough money uh, of the rich. Uh, in order to pay for um, Social Security and health for everybody else for the next uh, 50 years. Fair enough. Uh, so um, now those are those are what's unsustainable will not be sustained. So what are we going to do about it? And sooner or later we'll do something. We have to because it, it, the current system cannot go on. And even defaulting on the debt won't solve the problem. So what's going to happen? Either you're going to pay for a European welfare state with middle class taxes or you're going to reform the spending programs uh, so that um, you you help the people who need help without throwing a lot of money down a rat hole. Or you uh, you can start letting the economy grow like crazy to generate more tax revenues. Those right. are some options. We're going to choose one of them, and hopefully it won't be too painful along the way. Uh, but that's exactly uh, the question. They asked the reserve currency issue. Yeah, that's uh, that's a smaller effect. So it is kind of nice that the rest of the world likes to hold a lot of uh, Uncle Sam's debt. But that's not going to pay. The size of the entitlement stuff, it, let's just get general sizes of things. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office is saying 5% of GDP deficits uh, as far as the eye can see uh, because of unfunded uh, social programs. Th- that's a large number. And the world's appetite for dollars is is a steady level. Yeah. It's not something that grows 5% of GDP every year. Uh, yeah. It's like printing money. A gov- that's a government great can point. print a little bit of money. That is a great the government point. Can print a little bit of money and get, uh, you know, you get some benefit out of it, but that doesn't mean you can double, triple, quadruple the amount of money that you can print because there's only so much of it people want to hold. Well, that's new. Um, that's that's so a new. It's a, it's a small benefit, but it's, it's not one that grows over time. That's an insight that that we haven't had on the podcast before. That is, uh, boy, that really makes me stop and pause a little bit about the idea that the demand for a dollar you know they usually look at it well it's stable it's stable yeah but it doesn't grow that's that's something that's really interesting to think about the, the fiscal theory yeah, we, we need to find five percent of gdp per year of new money yeah. and that is not growing on trees and it's not growing from any magic demand for stay safe assets one of the uh one of the guys i really liked he he's, hasn't been as noisy or at least maybe he's been as noisy but no one has listened as much but when 
uh, when David Walker quit, I mean, he, he was kind of upset. And for those that don't know, David Walker was a comptroller general for the United States. He's the head of the GAO, basically the nation's you know chief accountant, I guess you'd say. And this guy worked for for Republicans and Democrats over several administrations. And when he was when he got he quit his job in frustration because he could not he he would file these reports of unsustainably say listen we're we're not gonna there's a point where you get past a point of no return here uh, particularly with the programs you mentioned mostly the the social security and health care and he quit his job and kind of went out on a rant you know on a a tour I guess trying to raise awareness and no one paid attention. And he said, you know, there there are the three things. We can raise taxes, we can lower spending, or we can grow the economy. He says, there's no way you can grow your way out of this problem. You know, it's it's too big. Uh, You'd have to have, you know, economic growth that's just, it's just not something you can count on all the time. Uh, Politically, you have, you know, the what is fiscal policy in a nutshell? It is taxes and spending, you know. Uh, We go to the House Ways and Means Committee and say, hey, let's find a way to get the means to to take care of this stuff so politically it's it's tough to do what does it look like to you know keep raising the debt ceiling because i I feel like there's going to have to be more pain than there is no democrat or republican really wants to talk about this it certainly wasn't uh hit by trump or biden in their little battle and uh the idea of a rematch of that just makes me want to you know move to europe but uh, it, it's a rough deal right there. What does it look like to have fiscal policy fail? Fiscal policy failing looks awful. Uh, and these are problems that are uh, easy to fix now and hard to fix later, especially if it's in the context uh, of a crisis. And, uh, I, I, you know, there is that frustration. Um, you know, it's been done before. Um, in the 1980s, there was a Social Security reform. Late 1980s, yeah. there was a tax sure. reform. Uh, our our government is capable of getting together and and uh, you know reforming things for the long run outside of the crisis. Once uh, once it really is a crisis, then it is much much more mm-hmm. uh, painful and costly uh, to fix things. And um, you know they let's let's not turn to politics too fast. But that uh, yeah, that's I, I like to it stay I like to stay neutral on that stuff. I, I really do. I I've been kind of a I feel like the people work harder for my vote if I don't give it away in advance so I like I like to stay on the money side of it but fiscal policy is decided by politicians it's a kind of an unfortunate well, fact to have to talk about but anyway but go politicians ahead politicians respond to voters um, you know b- basically right now both mm-hmm. sides understand all sides understand that we need to solve this voter run fiscal problem. Certainly, uh, but right now uh, they both they all everyone sees it as political suicide to do that, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to simply promise we're going to throw some more money at it uh, at you know the rat hole of whatever my side likes. So uh, you know until voters start saying no, we want you to fix the problem, they're they're not going to do it. They they all understand this, but they mm-hmm. serve what we want. I do want to say I think growth is is more of an option than you said it was. Awesome. I think the U.S. economy is is tremendously hobbled and could grow much more quickly if we would only allow it. And and I am I'm heartened that even the left is figuring this out. Um, you know, the, the, the people who want to put in windmills have discovered it takes ten years to get the permits to put in a windmill. And that that's not going to save climate change. Well, good. Uh, and maybe we the whole 10 years to get permits to do everything uh, can be fixed. Uh, also, it's not just about raising tax rates. Our tax code is a Swiss cheese. It's a rotten Swiss cheese. Mm-hmm. And, and I think just all the stories about Trump's taxes tell you everything you need to know about how idiotic our income tax is. Sure, sure. So I think there is a, a, there's a third way out that isn't just pain, pain, pain that uh, both the tax code and the way we spend money can both be reformed in order to, to do what needs to be done, but at much less uh, cost and pain to the economy. Now, this is highly political. I happen to agree with this idea. People, I hate to say this because then, you know, as soon as you, you know, try to start to agree with one person's policy, you begin to, you know, to have people hate you. And I think it's unfortunate. I, the thing I love about podcasts like this is, you know, I have no idea where you are politically, you know, zero. If you spent your time at the University of Chicago and Stanford, people might guess the left, but I found a lot of guys that are centrists 
uh, when you're an economist, it's a lot different. Now, if you're a sociology professor, that'd be different. Uh, but an economic and economics guys seem to be in the in the center. Uh, let's talk about a fair tax. Um, you know, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, for those that subscribe, I certainly do. Um, the fair tax is the shock our broken system needs. Yes or no? What do you think about the fair tax? Is a way to raise. Uh, is, is a way to no, raise without stuff. A- Right, right, right. Uh, all the details, I don't want, you know, there's, there's details about how you do things and so forth. But I think that is the kind of fundamental reform that needs to be on the table if we're going to hit these crises. We're, we're kind of in a uh, spot. I like to use the, uh, the, the uh, parable of the little old lady who ate the spider. Remember that one? Then, <laughs> then she eats the cat and the horse yep. and then yep. she dies. Yep. And that's kind of where we are. We, we have, you know, the income tax system, for example, was invented in uh, 1913 yep. and been patched, patch, 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 patch. And it's, uh, you know, the patches are sinking the ship uh, mm-hmm. and it's time to, to start all over again. And, and um, the fair tax, uh, a, a VAT, a flat tax, a consumption tax, if you ask any economist, right, left, and center, how do you raise money for the government with minimal economic damage? Uh, now, most of them will say, no, I don't want to answer that question. But if you force them to answer that question, something like uh, the, the flat tax, fair tax, consumption tax comes up. Throw out the income tax, estate tax, corporate tax, and basically a, a tax on everything you spend. Uh, get the rich guys at the Porsche dealer. Uh, that is just, that raises money for the government and does much, much less damage to the economy. And if you don't like that, it's because you have another question in mind. No, no. <laughs> but that's it. And for uh, that's why I think that is exactly the, the way we ought to go. Let's jump back to the fiscal theory of the price level. Again, just a reminder, you can learn more about uh, John as well at www.johnhcochran.com. And uh, when, when you say the fiscal theory of the price level, give us a little bit more clarity in the idea, because everyone says, all right, price stability is from the Fed. Price stability is from the Fed. It's about monetary policy. Talk about what fiscal theory and how it relates to the price level is. Uh, what's the magic Absolutely. of that? What's the magic of that book that readers are about to uh, give us a little taste of it? <laughs> so where does inflation fundamentally come from? Good question. The big answer to that in, in the book and my other writing is fundamentally inflation comes when there's more government debt outstanding, Mm -hmm. uh, which includes money, but also includes government bonds, uh, overall government debt relative to what people think the government will uh, eventually pay back by taxes greater than spending. And if you're sitting on say 30 trillion of government debt, and then you wake up one morning and say, you know, these guys are not ever going to pay this back. Bad stuff's coming. What do you do? The only thing you can do is try to buy stuff. And when you try to buy stuff, it sends up the prices. It's, it's just like uh, stock prices, the present value of dividends. When you wake up one morning and say, you know, this company is going down the tubes, you try to sell the stock and that just drives the price down. Mm-hmm. So the same mechanism, the same mechanism that underlies stock prices, ultimately, that's what drives inflation. People look at government debt and overall and say, it's not, uh, not going to be paid back. Let's get rid of it. And then they try to buy stuff and send the price. And that's pretty much what happened. The government sent out $5 trillion of extra debt in the pandemic. People, there was no talk about how we're going to pay this back. And people said, let's go spend it. Now that's different. How is that? Uh, let me uh, yeah. quickly. Yeah. Uh, that's different from the standard view of, of money because money is about different kinds of government debt. So I, we all say, right. suppose the government sends you $5 trillion. If the government had sent uh, $5 trillion of government bonds from the sky, uh, we would have had inflation. Uh, but it doesn't really matter whether what you have is is money or government bonds. It's just too much of both of the stuff is what causes inflation. Now, the Fed is still in there. The Fed sets, even in the fiscal theory, the Fed sets the interest rate. And the interest rate is tightly related to inflation. So the Fed has a lot of power about where inflation goes by setting interest rates, but it doesn't have complete power. And, and if the government hands out $5 trillion of money, no matter what the Fed does with interest rates, you're going to get inflation. So it's, uh, it's, uh, the Fed can guide where things are going, uh, but it doesn't have 100% control. So that's the nutshell of the fiscal theory of the price level. I'm, I'm horrified by the idea of uh, modern monetary theory. And uh, 
I'm not that sophisticated. I'm not an economist. I haven't taught as a professor. I'm a, a layman who's just read a lot on it. And uh, one of the books I read on MMT that was particularly frightening to me was by Stephanie Kelton. For people who don't know, she was a, a Bernie Sanders advisor, I believe, was her relationship with Bernie. But, uh, you know, the, the density and, and, you know, the, the, the idea, the density of what I would feel are bad ideas and seductive ideas in that book are, are interesting because it feels very much like Chavez in, uh, in Venezuela. But I don't know. You know, I, I also have enough humility, hopefully, to say, look, Andy, you've been a student for 30 years. You know, who, who really has figured this stuff out? It sounds, I mean, it almost sounds like you, tell, well, let me just have you talk about modern monetary theory. The idea that, you know, we can keep a dollar from, uh, for, we can keep dollars value by taxation. In other words, I, I think that's her main premise is that, you know, we really don't need the taxes. We, we don't really need to collect income tax at all. Uh, the purpose of taxes, this is Warren Mosler as well. The purpose of taxes is to create a man on the dollar. Look, everyone can have their crypto. Everyone can have their gold if they want. You can have whatever you want. But at the end of the day, you're going to pay your taxes in U.S. dollars. That's the only thing we're going to accept. And if you want to live in this country and work and, and try to earn money, you're going to pay us in U.S. dollars. And that you know creates a built-in demand for U.S. dollars. So we can borrow as much money as we want uh, because we can always print print the money to, to buy those bonds. And inflation is not a problem because we can just control with taxes. Well, what now someone's reading that book and I can see where a person says, yeah, well, I guess so. I mean, if you got to pay your taxes, uh, they, they have the power to raise them and that would create a demand for dollars. Uh, what's wrong with monetary, modern monetary theory? Well, that, um, let me point you to, uh, I wrote a review of a book in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which you can also find on my website. So for the longer answer, go read the review, but I'll give you a short answer. Okay. <laughs> um, monetary, monetary theory, uh, th- that, I, that basic thing you said is in fact true. And, and uh, fiscal theory, the price level also uses that concept that in the end, what determines the value of money is that it's acceptable in taxes. That if there's too much money floating out, floating around, the government can soak up that money by um by uh, by taxing away more than it spends yeah uh, in the end uh, so that that is correct now they mix that one correct thing with a whole bunch of incorrect things okay <laughs> because when you read when you read the book it's actually not about monetary theory it's a it's a, a long list of all the wonderful things we could do it's with very money seductive free very theory. seductive right I mean it sounds <laughs> utopian right yeah but let's uh, let's let's just let's analyze the central proposition. Okay, uh, because money can be soaked up by taxes, let's uh, print up a bunch of money to spend on things we want to spend on. Uh, then the inflation comes, and and what do we do? We soak it up with taxes. Well, that's the same as raising taxes to spend the money on on the things we want to spend on in the first place. Hmm. So if you just follow the logic a little bit, it does not it, you get to that point of oh you're raising taxes in order to spend money on the things you want to spend on. It wasn't free after all. The, the, now, how did they get out of that? Well, uh, and this is the quote, according to Kelton, quote, there is always slack in the U.S. economy. Uh, we'll mm-hmm. never actually have to do that tax raising because if you just print money, uh, the supply capacity of the economy is unlimited and the money, the demand will create its own supply and, and uh, you will never have to actually get to that point of raising mm-hmm. taxes. So mm-hmm. the point. well, that turned out to be totally wrong <laughs> Yeah, because we did exactly what they asked for was $5 trillion of money to be thrown out the window and given spent on all sorts of things. And they said, this won't cause any inflation. Don't worry. You won't have to raise taxes because uh, there's always slack in the economy. We did it and bingo inflation. And this inflation is just wonderful. It's terrible pain for all of us, but it's an intellectually clarifying moment. There is the supply limit of the U.S. economy. We are at that supply limit. All of Washington still, most of Washington still sort of believes in modern monetary theory because they still think the response to everything is to borrow more money and throw money at the problem. You're at the supply limit. If you create a job here, that takes a job away from somewhere else. If you spend more money on stuff that without taxing, that creates inflation. 
Now, when you're at the supply limit, the game is over. And and the modern monetary theorists have been kind of, uh, they have not said, good, oh, well, we have inflation. Now's the time to really raise taxes and soak up the money. No, 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 price controls. We didn't really mean mm-hmm. it. <laughs> wow. The, the, in, in the fiscal theory of the price level, uh, the reason I love, I, I just so appreciate having voices like your own and people that write books on this, because my feeling is, you, you mentioned, you know, politicians will do what the voters want. Well, an un, uh, a, a voter who, uh, there was an old, uh, uh, Jay Leno had this thing he called jaywalking, where he'd, he'd take a microphone. I loved it, yeah. He'd take a microphone out and he'd say, you know, who's the vice president? And they'd say, you know, whoever, right? Clint Eastwood, whatever, right? People'd laugh. If you, if you and I went jaywalking, you know, let's say we go out e- either on the campus of Stanford or even just down to Fisherman's Wharf or somewhere and we say, what's monetary theory or what is fiscal policy or what is uh, monetary policy? It'd be interesting to see what the electorate would say. So one of the things that, that I think is very important is you mentioned that well, politicians do what the people want. Well, that has a lot to do with the level of, of the education of the electorate, I would imagine, um, because if people don't understand the cause and effect of these things, particularly in inflation, you know, I mean, Stephanie's book has how many reviews? Um, you know, I, I don't know, probably a couple of thousand, maybe three, four thousand. It's, you know, four and a half star book. I think we ought to make the fiscal theory of the price level, <laughs> you know, a well-read book. Read them both and make up your own mind. What's your feeling on financial education of an electorate? Uh, and then we'll talk about it collectively, and then maybe we can talk about it in, as an individual. Well, I should, I should warn uh, our readers. I, um, my book is full of equations uh, that hers was empty of uh, because you have to convince the sort of scientific professional community that, that you're right. Uh, so it's not necessarily going to be uh, competing bestsellers, uh, but there it is. Uh, I think it is important actually to convince people uh, at the Fed and, and so forth that that's the right way of uh, thinking. And, and money is really Im- interesting. Part of why I, I study it it's not obvious in everyday life. Lots of economic policy is obvious in everyday life. You know, if you pass a rent control ordinance, what's going to happen is no one's going to build apartment buildings. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just where inflation comes from, uh, it's, it's not obvious walking around. And, and, you know, normal people are really smart, but they're, they have their normal lives to lead. But I would say, so education can be a dangerous thing, especially on college campuses these days. And it's easy to get a whole lot of education and things that are totally wrong. But I do think a basic common sense uh, does apply. The, the basic sort of uh, BS detectors, uh, e- even if one, as one pursues an education, is useful. Uh, but but uh, fact stuff down your throat from the current establishment isn't always uh, a way to getting a, okay. a more uh, educated uh, tax La- shaper. Just common sense. <laughs> La- last question, and I, I want to reiterate what you just said. I think you said basically people can can find some common sense uh, if they listen for it. Um, last question, then I'll let you go. You've been so gracious with your time. I, I couldn't run for office because I, I say things that politicians couldn't get away with. I tell my sons, I say things like, you know, son, there's no government policy that has the horsepower to help you out of a bad personal policy. And what's interesting, there's no government policy that's so awful that it could, you know, take away your, uh, you know, short of, of being in North Korea, take away your own personal power, you know, in, of your life. So let's say people say, uh, we like the challenge of a few equations. We, we actually would like to see some math on this. Let's get the fiscal theory of the price level and read it. What can people do uh, to protect themselves if we have uh, these difficult fiscal times? I mean, what, what, uh, what do you recommend people do? Uh, that's that's a hard one. I, I would first of all, um, policies can take away your personal power, and I, I think that there's uh, you know people who have run afoul of regulatory agencies uh, discover quickly. Um, so so be uh, as, as a voter and a citizen, uh, be aware to um, maintaining your your rights to do what you want with um, your property, your business, and and your life. 
these, if we go into a fiscal slash inflation crisis, it's going to be, there isn't a magic uh, way out. Um, and you know, other things that happen in other countries like, um, Argentina can't here. Don't just assume that the U S will always mm. hope the U S will always do the right thing. And, and after we've tried everything else, but not, it doesn't always happen. And I, you know, there isn't really a, a magic bullet. I mean, I guess see it coming, see the crash coming before other people do is always great advice, but we're all human and, and it's not going to be easy to do. Uh, but you know, it, uh, if it turns into a crash, it turns into, uh, people lose a lot of money on a lot of their uh, investments. And even if you were smart enough, you know, there's things like by, uh, the inflation protected securities, that's a good way to protect yourself yeah. against inflation. I bonds, uh, yeah. Real, uh, real assets are going to do better than, than false. But uh, a government in a fiscal crisis is going to grab all the wealth it can. Mm. And, uh, it's very hard to legally protect yourself against that. So let's just, uh, hope we don't get that fiscal crisis. Um, because it's going to be hard, hard on all of us. If you want the challenge, and I think it's a great idea, read the fiscal theory of the price level. You can visit our guest, John Cochran, at www.johnhcochran.com. I don't think people can learn enough about this. I don't know that we need to predict the crash. You prepare for one um, the same way you might buy insurance on your home. You don't have to go nuts about it, but it's certainly something you would buy. I don't obsess that my home would burn down. I just accept it as a possibility. And uh, I don't I don't over-insure my home. And I think uh, some preparation with some financial education on the personal level uh, is, uh, is how a person prepares. So I like the idea of preparation, maybe more than trying to predict how deep or how awful things get. Just get prepared. Oh, absolutely. Let me just, uh, on, on general investment advice, <laughs> uh, finding some guru who's going to tell you what's going to happen and going all in on that yeah. is a bad strategy versus Amen. understand there's risks Amen. and diversify your risks um, and make sure that if bad things happen, you're still going to make it through. Uh, is that's We live in a world of uncertainty. Just accept that fact rather than try to pick exactly what's going to happen is, is excellent financial advice. I wish I had more time with you. I've already extended past uh, what we scheduled. So I thank you for, uh, for just being so open with your answers and very succinct. Uh, this can be a complex topic and our goal is always to make it simple. I think you've helped us achieve that, uh, today. Uh, would you be willing to come back, uh, if we have, uh, you know, something happen, uh, that proves your book, uh, prophetic? Oh, of, of course. And you've proved yourself to be a great interviewer. Uh, <laughs> I'll put in a, a little plug here for, um, I have a blog called the grumpy economist. Oh, let's do that. Uh, so More. If you want to read it, want to read about stuff with, uh, without uh, too many equations. Read the Grumpy Economist blog. Um, I have a, a website, as you mentioned. There's a nice essay on there called Fiscal Histories that has no uh, equations whatsoever and, and talks <laughs> about U.S. Uh, inflation with this fiscal point of view. That's a better way to start than plowing through the, uh, the Ph.D. level equations in, in the book. And I'll also plug the Good Fellows uh, podcast uh, and video a series on YouTube that I do with my colleagues, uh, Neil Ferguson and HR McMaster, uh, which is a, a great fun time. And we talk about all sorts of fun things. Oh, these plugs are welcome um, for sure, because more, more educations, but I've been an education advocate for uh, 30 years and uh, I guess I'm a kind of a nerd too. I like this stuff. So thank you so much. You've been listening to John Cochran on the Cash Flow Academy show. Hope you enjoyed our conversation, everyone. Again, uh, this is your host, Andy Tanner. This is where we try to make investing uh, and money and cash flow as simple as possible. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.